Jo, schönen guten Tag, herzlich willkommen zurück für die Leute, die geblieben sind hier auf der Bühne 7 der Media Convention. Ich freue mich, dass äh, einige Leute hier sind. Ich hätte tatsächlich erwartet, dass weniger Leute da sind, einfach nur, weil Algorithmus in dem Titel steht. Wer von Ihnen weiß denn, was Algorithmen sind? Einmal die Hand hoch, bitte. Das ist schon mal etwas, ne? Wenn dann, relativ einfach, ein Algorithmus ist der Weg, äh, um ein Problem zu lösen. Gerade eben, wer das mitbekommen hat bei dem äh, großen Thema Smart Regulations, da ging es dann auch schon ein bisschen rum. Aber vielleicht sind die Problemfelder unterschiedlich und deswegen weiß man eigentlich gar nicht so richtig, welchen Algorithmus man eigentlich bauen sollte, um entsprechend, äh, entsprechendes Problem überhaupt lösen zu können. Ich kann keine Probleme lösen, dafür kann ich ihn Rubik's Cube lösen, habe ihn aber nicht dabei, ich kann es nicht zeigen. Aber dafür braucht man auch Algorithmen. Aber es gibt spezielle Leute, die da wesentlich tiefer in dieser Materie drin sind und wir haben hier ein, äh, eine, ein Diskussionspanel, da freue ich mich drauf. Ähm, und wir haben eine Moderatorin dafür gewinnen können, die dort sehr ähm, firm ist in diesem Thema. Ihr Name, das ist äh, die Theresa Züger und sie wird das Ganze hier moderieren. Wir haben drei Speaker mit auf der Bühne. Das wird alles sehr spannend und das Thema heißt äh, From Bias to Best Practice. Wie bauen wir uns eigentlich die Algorithmen, die wir bauen wollen? Theresa Züger wiederum äh, ist Beirat im Whistleblower-Netzwerk. Finde ich super geil. Äh, nebenbei ist sie auch noch Projektleiterin äh, des, äh, des äh, Media Policy Labs. Entschuldigung. Und ganz nebenbei hat sie auch mal einen Doktortitel gemacht in Medienwissenschaften. Also ich glaube, die Frau kennt sich aus. Und die bitte ich jetzt auf die Bühne. Theresa, los geht's. Hallo. Ich nehme meine Redner gleich mit. So, welcome. This is uh, going to be uh, a session that is held in English. If you want a translation, that's possible. You get a headset and then everything is translated to German. Also, deutsche Übersetzung gibt es, wenn man sich einen Kopfhörer holt hinten. Okay, so um, the name of this session is From Bias to Best Practice, How to Build the Algorithms We Want. And the starting point uh, of this session is the idea that has already been mentioned by Chelsea Manning this morning, that algorithms are never neutral. They're programmed in a certain way, they're trained with data sets, and this knowledge that algorithms are never neutral is pretty widespread, I think. So we have an awareness of the problem today. And many call for something like ethics of algorithms, others think that we need certificates um, for algorithms to meet a certain standard. And we would like to push the debate in that, that direction and ask, okay, what do we need to change to um, create a process um, where technology is developed the way we want it, where algorithms are de developed the way society needs them. But first, we need to understand how biases in algorithms evolve how they affect users, and how they can be made visible. And uh, to achieve this goal, I have uh, a top set of speakers with me today. I'm going to start with Aniko Hanak. She's a researcher at the Northeastern University in Boston. And her work investigates a variety of websites, search engines, and online stores, job search sites, and marketplaces. And she created a methodology in her PhD that she calls algorithmic auditing. And this methodology helps her to uncover potential biases and negative impacts of large online systems. We're going to hear about that in just a second. Um, first, I'm going to introduce <laughs> Alexander Sengerlaub, um, who is my second speaker here. Um, he works for the Stiftung Neue Verantwortung here in Berlin, and there he deals with questions of digital media change and ask, is asking what extent, uh, to what extent this changes journalism, the public, and democracy. And his team, um, with his team, he examined fake news very thoroughly. I think the, it's the most comprehensive study that we had in Germany about the fake news phenomena, and he's going to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to have a debate, how that is tied into algorithmic decision-making. And my uh, third guest, you might have already heard his keynote this morning, is uh, Dipayan Ghosh. He's a fellow at New America and the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, where he works on digital privacy, artificial intelligence, and civil rights issues. And until recently, Dipayan worked on issues of global privacy and public policy for Facebook, but he has also been a policy advisor for the Obama White House. So uh, let's jump into the topic, and we start with a little input from Aniko Hanak. Thank you. Yes, please, applause. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me. 
So as Teresa mentioned, algorithms have been the focus of my research for, for the past eight years. So I'm going to try to give a very quick overview of what I've been working on. So about eight years ago, when I got into research, uh, that's when some of the first scary examples started to appear in the media about what can go wrong with algorithms. So what are the potential harmful side effects? Um, for example, the so-called filter bubble, which we heard of a lot in the past, um, in the day, uh, today, and uh, also price discrimination, which is also the effect of personalized content. Um, and then, since then, basically, we're flooded with kind of scary news on the topic. For example, racial biases in the ads that are served by Google and Facebook. Um, articles are warning about discrimination in the black box algorithms used for predictive policing or making parole decisions. A final, finally, discrimination on Uber or Airbnb. And the list really goes on. Um, but what caught my attention back when I started my PhD was that most of these articles were based on kind of single bad examples or isolated cases. But of course, as researchers, what we want to know is how often does this happen? How many people are affected? Um, and how worried should we really be? So this is what motivated me to create large-scale systematic measurements about algorithms and their effects on users and society. So let me first quickly introduce the world that I'm trying to understand and at the same time show you how we in research model the source of all, all of these bad examples. So over the past 10, 20 years, there's been this new ecosystem forming on the web in which web-based services and, and our phone apps are constantly competing for our attention. And as users are interacting with websites, companies track their every move. So what they search for, what they shop for, where they go, health data, and so on. And then all of this data is fed into so-called big data algorithms that try to shape the content to the user's interest. And of course, the more we interact with these websites, the more data they have about us. And before we notice, the web, for me, might look completely different from what you see. And the problem is that we really have no idea what data is used in these algorithms or how the algorithms work. So all we really see is kind of the right side of this figure. But everything else is basically hidden from us uh, because most of these systems are proprietary and non-transparent. And this is what makes measurement really challenging. So there is no transparency about the algorithms. Um, and this is what made me um, come up with this algorithmic auditing methodology, where we essentially try to observe these algorithms uh, externally. We kind of manipulate what we feed into the algorithm, and then see what comes out and try to infer what happens in between. And the two main questions that we typically try to answer is, first of all, how much of the content that we see is personalized. So actually, in practice, when I search on Google, how many results that I get are personalized? And second, why? So what are the specific user features that drive this personalization? So to answer the first question, we can actually look at real users' data. So we take a bunch of different users, we make them run the exact same queries. So in this case, in my example, I have Google here, but it could be any service whatsoever. And then we just compare um, what kind of web pages come back and how different are these results for each of these users. But then to answer the second question, why is all this content personalized, um, it's a little bit more tricky. We want to know, for example, how gender or age and other features affect the results that we see. So the idea that we came up here uh, with was to create sort of fake accounts, in this case, fake accounts for Google, that we are all able to control. So to Google, it still seems like uh, we have a bunch of users, but actually, they are all controlled by me. Um, so in case I want to know how, let's say, my gender affects the results that I'm seeing, I can create some male and some female accounts and make them behave otherwise exactly the same. So whatever difference I will see is going to be definitely due to my gender. Um, so with this methodology in hand, I first wanted to kind of uncover the filter bubble. Um, so I was looking at what is the average personal 
personalization out there. I was looking at Google and Bing, since they're the, the biggest search engines used out there. And I found that the most determining factor in personalization was users' location and whether they're logged in uh, at the time of the search. And then the second sector that I focused on quite extensively was online retail, because it's actually a huge problem for policymakers, um, because online di price discrimination is very hard to detect or monitor. So just to be clear on what this um, setting up such a system means, we have 30, 40 browsers simultaneously running searches um, uh, for months and months. And the reason I'm saying that is because it's actually quite hard for policymakers to, let's say, set up the same system if they want to test whether uh, some platform um, has, has price discrimination. And um, yeah, this is one of those cases when policymaking policy actually meets research. Uh, the EU Commission has reached out to our group multiple times to ask us to t test specific platforms. And for example, they charged Euro Disney uh, when we uncovered some price discrimination that they did. Um, and then uh, I want to mention a different scenario in which big data algorithms might have a huge effect. Namely, when the content owned by the service providers is about people. So this sounds kind of complicated, but what I mean is, for example, job search sites or dating sites or all sorts of other social sites where people willingly provide personal information. And this is a very important distinction uh, compared to what I was talking about before, because the companies don't even have to go after users and kind of track their data in secret. I will happily provide LinkedIn all sorts of personal information about myself in the hopes of finding a job. Um, and then, of course, this personal information triggers stereotypes and biases when we de decide who we want to hire or who we want to date. And combined with the algorithms, this might result in reinforced discriminatory effects. And this is indeed what we see on all of the websites that I so far investigated. So I focus mostly on employment-related platforms, given that a lot of the labor economy went online in the past years. Um, there's more and more freelancing sites. Uh, there is more and more job search sites online, and so on. And uh, employees are not yet protected online against discrimination like they are in the offline world. So auditing these websites means collecting data, such as user profile pages, or the user's social networks, uh, where they show up in a search list for a recruiter, and so on, and then look for systematic differences between different user groups. So on all of these sites that we investigated, we see that demographics relate to success and the opportunities of these workers. Um, on the, but what's really interesting, and it's kind of the challenging part of the work, is that these biases present themselves differently on every side. So what I mean is on the hiring sites, for example, we see that women are ranked lower in the search result list when the recruiters are looking for people for most of the job categories. But then when we look at freelancing sites, the measure of success is more what kind of reviews and ratings people get. So this is where we see the difference. And uh, to mention another site, Dribbble, which is a design community, the difference is manifest in the number of likes and comments that people receive. Uh, there's a large gender gap, actually, in the number of likes um, that men and women get on the products that they create. And I want to emphasize that, of course, none of this is intentional. So the system just automatically picks up on the bias and the personal data and in the decision-making of people who interact with these sites. And the algorithms on top might just reinforce this bias that's already there. So just to very quickly sum up, um, detecting these problems and quantifying them is really only the first step in a long process. So I realized that I mostly mentioned kind of negative things, but we really just got to the more constructive part where we can provide more transparent systems to users, for example, about what data is collected about them and how it is used, see the GDPR. And then we can start focusing on understanding the long-term effects of these systems, 
uh, not only on individual users, but society as a whole. And I think the final goal is building accountability. I hope that maybe you can see it in the bottom. It's sort of the most long-term goal. Uh, what I mean is once we detect a problem, whose responsibility is it actually to fix it? Um, and of course, solving these problems will require the collaboration of companies and policymakers. And I hope I convinced you that also researchers play a crucial role in this process. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, great introduction to the topic. Um, and I would like to jump in with a question to you, Dipayan. Like sure. you, you work for Facebook. Do you think they have awareness of this problem internally? Uh, I, th I think they absolutely do have awareness of the, of the issue. And uh, there's, this, there's a very difficult commercial tension here, whether we're talking about Facebook or whether we're talking about any of the other companies that you showed in your slides. The commercial tension is that for all of these companies, they want to protect their algorithms. They don't want to do the things on your last slide because it could cut into their intellectual property. It could cut into their secret sauce. It could expose privacy and security risks uh, implicit in their algorithms and in, implicit in their storage and collection of data. And so providing that kind of transparency is, is exactly the type of thing that cuts straight into their business model, uh, whether it's Facebook or whether it's TaskRabbit or whether it's GitHub. And uh, so, so that's, that's a very difficult commercial tension uh, between the commercial interests of the industry and doing right by, by the individual consumer or the user. So I think we've got a lot more that, that needs to be done um, by regulators, by government, uh, and, and people need to become more and more aware of, of these, these issues that are being described so eloquently. A little follow-up on that. Like, do they have internal processes to deal with uh, algorithmic biases? Or is it just like, okay, we know the problem, but or is there something implemented to, to change it? Yeah, well, I, I think that the, there are... Uh, there is a lot of consideration uh, to, this, to this problem. And in fact, I'll give a recent example. So uh, Facebook, uh, about three years ago, introduced a feature in the United States called ethnic affinity clusters. And of course, the, the whole advertising management system on Facebook, similar to other internet platforms, works in the following way. An advertiser can use the ad manager and pick out the particular interest categories that he or she wishes and target certain communities based on you know, gender or based on their, their interests in different things. And one of those interests that Facebook introduced is ethnic affinity clusters um, in the United States. And there were three main ones, Asian Americans, African Americans, and Hispanic Americans. Uh, that the company introduced. And very quickly, the civil rights community picked up on this. And I think there was a robust discussion about how this can directly implicate uh, the idea of protection of civil rights. Uh, because what if an advertiser goes into the platform and targets uh, a particular community based on their race, based on, or maybe may based on their interest in African American culture or Asian American culture, um, knowing that you know 60% or 80% of that group is probably of that race or ethnicity. Uh, and what if the ad itself, what if the content and the form of targeting is discriminatory uh, in some way? And so I think the company did have a robust discussion internally and with external players about that, and in fact took a really positive step forward in cutting off access for advertisers to use those kinds of inter interest categories in ways that implicate civil rights law. Okay. So there is consideration, but these are just steps in the right direction. M much more needs to be done. I want to come back to your method. Uh, or did, did you want to respond to that? Just very yes, please add something. I just wanted to mention that I think there is an important distinction between companies like Facebook, who actually have the staff to deal with 
problems like this internally, but then it's actually very easy to put up a website. It takes like three people and let's say it's going to be a freelancing site for dog walking or something, and then that tiny company is not going to have staff dedicated to deal with these kinds of problems. And that, that's very true. Um, I have a question concerning uh, your methodology, um, because as far as I heard, uh, algorithms like the Facebook newsfeed algorithm um, are very complex. And would your methodology also work with these complex uh, algorithms? Because you say that you kind of, from the outside, try to understand what has to, what's happening in between. So you, you have an input and then you analyze an output. But uh, how complex can the algorithm become? Or is it then more difficult to use your methodology? It can become infinitely complex, obviously. Okay. The more complex it is, the, the more measurements it takes to figure out what's going on. But actually, I'm not necessarily trying to reverse engineer what the algorithm exactly consists of. Okay. I'm more focused on how it affects the users on average. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so during the last years, we have uh, witnessed more and more watchdogs in institutions growing around uh, this issue. And do you think that this is enough to, to tackle this problem? Can we just, after the algorithms have done their magic and their work, uh, see, okay, there's, there's a bias and we have to talk about it? Or um, shouldn't we implement processes while algorithms are created? Question to everyone. <laughs> I will answer briefly and just say that uh, I think it's important that advocates do continue to push, uh, but I don't think these ad hoc, one-off conversations with one company or with three companies is enough. I don't think it's scalable even for one company. In fact, if we think about Facebook or Google, uh, you know, they have a breadth of different uh, platforms, and each of those platforms does any number of things using algorithms. And uh, ethnic affinity clusters is only one example of a space that absolutely needs a little bit more scrutiny. Uh, and I think the advocacy groups are doing something that is tremendously important, but it's just, it's just not enough. It's not a scalable solution to the way that the internet works in the collection of data and the network effect of leveraging that data and applying it uh, to show you the content that you are likely to find most engaging or the ads that you're likely to find most engaging and click on. Uh, so I don't think it's a scalable solution um, and in fact, a, a lot of the solutions which you suggest, which I absolutely agree with, I think are, are really difficult to push forward because of that commercial tension. It, it, we'll have to defeat a lot of political gridlock. And um, so I, I, think, I think the future is, is actually bleak on this front unless things change uh, considerably. Yeah, I guess it's about transparency. This is the most important thing uh, we need right now to understand what's going on in at Facebook, on Twitter, or whatever. So there are some interesting projects in Germany. For instance, we have the Schufer project. Yes. The Schufer is a German score. By algorithm for Watch. Yes. By algorithm Watch. They try to find out how is the score, and people could crowdfund this project and give the data to the scientists and we need to, maybe we need more something like this where people give their data to scientists and then we can have a look into the algorithms yeah and i think you're kind of pushing into an interesting direction because i wondered uh, if i as a user have the experience that i feel discriminated by a system what can i do what would you recommend me to do if i feel that somehow I feel treated unfairly. What's your recommendation? Because we're talking about something that is so powerful, but the ones experiencing it have no tools to tackle it. Use Anyone? the mess. <laughs> so, yeah, that, <laughs> would be, that would be one answer. Like, oh. uh, coming up with a group of people and combining efforts to find out what is actually going on. But that is the problem for the individual. It's often so invisible. It's a super hard question. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't think I'm giving the right solution, but I would maybe contact someone like our research group to actually make a big fuss about it in the media after some measurement. But 
it's obviously not the way to go forward. But this, yeah. yeah, okay, but I, I think it's definitely one way to bring more light into this very difficult uh, big picture. Okay, um, we're shifting the debate a little bit to hear a little bit about a phenomena that has been all over the news uh, during the last year. And uh, Alexander will introduce this angle by showing us a little bit about a study that he did um, on fake news and how they spread during the last year um, during the election time. And also, and I think that part is really in interesting, how the debunking has been taking place. And we want to include that idea a little bit and discuss about how maybe this phenomena of fake news has been incentivized by algorithms. But we're going to hear about that later a little bit more. So please, the stage is yours. Okay, I'm just talking a bit about uh, what we did last year, because um, after the American election, people are really afraid all over Europe, oh my gosh, the fake news are coming. And we wanted to find out, oh, do we have a big problem? And how big is the problem? Maybe it's not so big as we think. And so we, we did a big study. And um, yeah, we, we did content analysis of the whole public sphere in Germany. So it included media outlets, but also Twitter and Facebook and so on. And the interesting point for Germany, and I, I want to make it short, of course, we have a problem with fake news, but it's not so big. Mm -hmm. it's a, it is a problem. It's a mainly a white-wing propaganda problem. The AfD is the most common fake news sharer in, in, in Germany. But um, the interesting point is that um, the German democracy is relatively robust in comparison to other countries. And this is because of we have um, strong media, we have high belief in media, and people are not on Facebook and Twitter, <laughs> for instance, in comparison to the US. And this is a really, really important point, because when we thought about um, Facebook, for instance, and if we are able to shift something in the algorithm, um, would it change something or not, we would say in the end, no, because it's about the human factor in the end. And I, I found a really nice quote from, from a guy from Forbes, maybe it's coming now, and he, he mentioned it together with the discussion about Cambridge Analytica, and he thought, if you were targeted with content from Cambridge Analytica, it's because the data from your Facebook profile indicated that you were part of the key demographic, most likely to believe it, no matter how ridiculous or false it was. Did your Facebook data show that you support Fox News, or like right-wing extremist propaganda like Infowars and Alex Jones, or Breitbart or Rush Limbo? Did your Facebook data show that you are anti-LGBTQ, or pro-life, or an NRA supporter, or a white supremacist? So, we can't forget about the human factor in all this, and that the algorithm in Facebook is mirroring what you are like to read, what you like to do, what you like to talk, and so on. And so it's, there's another nice um, quote that was coming next. <laughs> so, and so he made it up like this. He said, I said to a guy, tell me, what is about cocaine? and that makes it so wonderful. And he said, because it intensifies your personality. And I said, yes, but what if you're an asshole? <laughs> and we can transfer this to the algorithms a little bit, because it's your decision that you follow the AfD, that you follow Donald Trump, that you follow some crucial theories around, and the algorithm is offering you this context, this content. And so I find it really hard to find a good answer, so how to change something on Facebook and then we get rid of fake news. Um, Can I jump in with a question? <laughs> because I would like to challenge that uh, quote a little bit, because what Facebook is doing, it's not only taking what we already liked, it's also predicting. And I think that came out in Dipayan's keynote quite well, that uh, we're assumed to like things. We're matched with other kinds of audiences. So algorithms assume something about us and then base their predictions on it. And I think that is a driver that brings a bigger audience um, to and, and, and gives a dynamic to, to these mechanisms. So I think that is kind of missing in your quote a little bit, don't you think? Mm -hmm. But where are the predictions coming from? It's coming from the sites you liked before. And this is the content vessel, I would say, that is um, yeah, your choice in the end. So if we say, 
we find an algorithm that shows you more information from other news sites, then it wouldn't be the same concept of the algorithm at Facebook. So I would say... But would you really say that's the answer to all algorithmic bias? It's no, just the no, people? No. Facebook is really special. You, you okay. can't compare the, the, um, the Facebook algorithm to other ones where there's a totally other functionality inside of this. But when it comes to Facebook, I would say it's not a platform for information in the end. What do you think? This is quite challenging, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think both of you are right. I'll, I'll say the diplomatic thing. Um, well, uh, I, I think, uh, Alex, you're right because you're absolutely right that the inferences that internet companies, tech companies make about us are based on who we are in real life. If we're reading Breitbart, if we're reading, reading the New York Times or SZ or FAZ, uh, those are things that send a signal to the, to the data collector, to use a term from the GDPR. Those are um, signals that we are of a certain kind, we have a certain preference for, for certain types of media, for certain types of ideas, and yes, we are, we are packaged into little groups of people, like barn animals, um, so that our collective attention can be sold to advertisers, to the, to the advertiser that bids the highest price. And so I absolutely agree that we, we are, uh, F Facebook's data profile about us, Facebook's understanding of who we are as people is based on who we are in real life. Um, not 100% accurate, but let's say, based on how much we use Facebook, anywhere between 50% to 99% accurate. Um, and that it's that accuracy that, that I think, uh, you know, we, we need to understand a little bit better. Where I do think I, I agree with you is that there is something that we can do about it, because the problem is in part the fact that, you know, we are a reflection, uh, what, what, what internet companies think of us is a reflection of who we are. That's absolutely true, but at the same time, disinformation operators and other, other people pur purveying fake news, propagating fake news, are doing it, are, they are creating falsehoods and spreading it to people in a nefarious way. That's, that's the practice that I believe we could do something about. I think it's complicated. I think it's very complicated, and I, I think that it's actually in the, in the internet company's interest to have no scrutiny on that whatsoever so that they can continue to, to do what they're doing without any regulatory oversight. But I think there, there are a number of things that could be done. Data privacy is one of them. Market competition is another. Stricter regulation is another. Um, public, public education of consumers is another. Uh, public service journalism. Uh, is another. Um, th these are all steps that could be taken, but you're right. I mean, how do you how do you popularize an idea or educate the public in a broad way? It's very difficult. So I want to shift the debate a little bit again because we, we we're coming a little bit from the angle of who's responsible here, and you were saying, okay, companies are just reflecting the data that they get from users. But I do want to stress uh, the argument that in the process of making our algorithms, I think it changes, or it's a very important in what environment these algorithms are created. Can you elaborate a little bit about your opinions to that idea? Like, how does the environment uh, of technology development influence the biases that we find later? I would say a lot. <laughs> so, so this is something I already wanted to add earlier uh, when you were talking about what could be changed. I think at the very earliest stage of the development of any algorithm or even any sort of tool, technological tool that we use, it's, it's super important to I don't know, do proper tests on uh, diverse demographics, for example, that usually doesn't happen. Um, and I also see on these... Um, freelancing sites and these types of platforms that the users who arrive first, uh, they really determine kind of the stereotype successful person on the website or, or the culture of the website. And then this will really impact in a 
like for very long term who's who's going to succeed on these platforms as an insider what do you think <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if, how much of an insider i am anymore but uh <coughs> Well, algorithms are, are developed by companies and, and by uh, other kinds of organizations. And um, by nature, what that means is that an algorithm is often developed by one person or a small group of people. And a small group of people necessarily has a, a certain amount of knowledge and a certain amount of human experience. They haven't experienced everything. They, they aren't completely knowledgeable about everything. They uh, have their own assumptions and definitions of different ideas. And those ideas get reflected in, in what they create, of course. And there's nothing wrong with that. What we need is more transparency, as you say, uh, more uh, oversight over, over what is created. That can happen internally within a company if companies can get it right or maybe it needs to be imposed uh, by, by the government. Um, but I, I really like that idea. There are two uh, ideas around that I would like to have your opinions on. On one side, people say that, okay, we need to increase diversity in uh, teams of coders. And on the other side, there's this idea of creating something like a Hippocratic Oath, like we have for doctors, for coders. So you have to pledge allegiance to only creating good code. What do you think of these two ideas? Is it really about diversity in the teams? Or would a code like that, an oath like that, help us? Or are there other ideas that you think should be part of the discussion? Maybe both, and also including um, in a modern uh, methodology to design um, algorithms. For instance, design thinking is a method you can use to design code as well, to go out, test it with people, find out if it's working in, in every um, group. And I guess to have an open process with a lot of transparency helps a lot if, you, yeah. if you're coding algorithms. What do you think? I'm just thinking about this oath idea. I've never yeah. heard of it before. But to me, it seems like it would be pretty hard to implement in practice. No matter how well you mean as a coder, you might not necessarily know the effects. Ultimately, it really depends on the people who start using your service. Um, it might change over time. Yes. So you might have to constantly adapt your system to who's using it and how it responds. So yeah. Let me, uh, let me introduce a third idea, because yes. I, I don't, I'm all for diversity in, in hiring uh, and in development of algorithms. I'm all for diversity, of course. Um, but if you take a team of two coders who are of a certain kind and, and broaden it to five coders who are more diverse, let's say, that's still going to result in a somewhat of a biased view. That's only five people. Uh, who are carrying with them five different life experiences. Similarly, the, I, I agree that the Hippocratic Oath method, uh, without offending any of my friends who are working on such, uh, such projects, I think it's, it seems very hard to implement, and we'd have to get a lot of buy-in from many different players across the industry to, to make anything work. Um, now, it could happen, but it will take time, it will take a lot of effort, and it could it could run rampant with corporate influence pretty quickly. Uh, so let me introduce another idea, which is a little bit more radical, but, but gets to the, to the point of transparency. Uh, there's an idea that's been raised uh, by a couple of experts um, around, of course, more broadly, algorithmic transparency, which is something you've, you've discussed at length. And, and, but more specifically, input out, out input-output algorithms, uh, sorry, input-output APIs, um, where we ha let's say we have a black box algorithm like Google's um, search engine, or Facebook's news feed, or the recommendation system behind Task TaskRabbit. And let's say we give TaskRabbit a set of inputs as to what types of search terms might be, uh, might be searched and, and um, what types of jobs we might want done. Um, and then TaskRabbit, of course, takes that data and shoots out information to you. 
What if you made that whole process a little bit more transparent by enabling outside actors to access an API that allows them to quickly put those inputs in and see what outputs come out so that you can test a whole bunch of different combinations and see whether there might be any algorithmic bias uh, or other sorts of discriminatory outcomes that are resulting from the algorithm. Um, I think that's, you know, that's, that doesn't give you the full algorithmic transparency, but that's, of course, something that the industry is going to fight tooth and nail uh, to their death. Um, something that's maybe more saleable could be, could be something around this input-output API idea, which is not mine, is, is, is uh, developed by other experts. I really like the idea, and uh, we've been thinking about that as well. But I think, yeah, you're right, that we're not yet at that step to, to actually know what this would need to look like. So yeah. Um, I would like to include a few questions from the audience. So if you want to ask something, please raise your hand. And I hope we have a few people running around with a microphone. I see no one running. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see people start to run. Okay, there is a microphone coming over here, and we have a question from the audience. I think yeah, there's one person with a red shirt. Yes, you are the first question, and then person behind you. Uh, well, well, my question actually is something. Can you introduce I'm, yourself? Just oh, yes. Okay, okay. I'm uh, Hunter Hombels from Bonn. He's a researcher. Hi. Hi. Um, my question actually is something I would like to add because we were talking about Cambridge Analytica and I tensively read up on them last year when they were not all the hype, but there were many American articles already about them. Um, and in these articles, uh, they said that they, <clears throat> they're actually much more manipulative. They're not only intensifying, you know, the Breitbart guys or whatever, well, they're looking at what are the, the intents, the attitudes of the people, and so they also approach, with their Facebook posts, they also approach Democrats. For example, they would do things like they would approach um, a black person with a fake news about uh, Hillary saying something deeply uh, racist. So to repel the person from um, voting for, for her. So they, they had actually different kinds of strategies, and I think so the, the problem, to, in my point of view, is much, much more differentiated and, and dangerous because they are really manipulative, not only intensifying, you know, just not taking the cocaine, but giving you the thing you need to change your behavior. Thank you. Can you give the mic to the person behind you? Yes. Any responses? Or? Uh, that was no question. So uh, if someone like wants to, you want to respond. OK, let's collect the next question. Uh, question, yes. And uh, then we'll have your response. Because I, I already wanted to add this earlier. I think, oh, sorry. No, please go ahead. Um, the, we have to differentiate between the Facebook posts that we see because our friends are posting something or all the sponsored ads. Yes. And I think why, when I first joined Facebook, I thought all I'm going to see is going to be, I don't know, cats and babies. And instead, now, every third post I see is paid by someone for me to see it. And essentially, they can show me whatever they want. So it's not just amplifying uh, my interests. Very true. We have uh, a panel about that tomorrow in the evening. So <laughs> yes, and now your question. OK, thank you. Uh, my name is Wilke. I'm from Frankfurt. And thank you all for the discussion, and especially, sorry? <laughs> Cool. Um, and thank you especially for the talk about your studies, which uh, made me curious. Did you come across um, algorithmic behavior which is not analog to um, biases that we know from our human interaction, or did you actually find um, phenomena inside your uh, bias um, analysis that is new, that is sort of like the bureaucratic um, Demon ex machina, did you come across something like that? Hmm. Very did interesting question. Thank you. Um, I can't say I found anything extremely new, but there's really processes in society that we don't notice in our everyday lives that really, really get amplified. For example, um, the way social feedback works online. Um, so 
for example, if I'm a designer and I start building up my online profile on Dribbble, let's say, um, suddenly there's a huge influence on my profile from other people in the way they review me or they give any other types of social feedback uh, that I have absolutely no control over. And I feel like this is maybe a subtle difference compared to the way it works offline. So there's just less control for users uh, in general. There is another question up here. Yes. Um, you all talked about regulation a lot. What are the next steps um, for what you think regulation should look like and what is realistic for companies, small and large, to implement? And how would it, what would the oversight look like in order to make sure the regulation is enacted across the world? Um, obviously, in the US, we saw Zuckerberg come to Congress and leave, and it seems like we're sort of at a standstill again. So what are the next steps right now? Thank you. Who wants to answer first? Like, it's the biggest question that you pretty much can ask for. <laughs> I guess uh, the next regulation that is coming up is the regulation of the advertising industry. For instance, we have so much rules when we have advertising in television, in radio, and so on, and we will have the same amount of regulation, I'm sure, next or in the next years about advertising, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. I, I think that's right. I think that's, that's the first place to start because we can actually see the industry at work, we can see what's happening, and we can see the negative externalities and regulate the negative externalities. Um, and I think, uh, speaking from a US perspective, given we don't have something that is protective of the individual like GDPR, and nor do we have a fundamental right to privacy, um, I think that in the US and more globally, we need to take um, both Germany specifically and the EU as an example going forward and figure out a way to not think about just the, just the short term, just the national elections in 2018 or 2020 uh, in regard to um, you know, uh, political ad transparency, uh, and better detection of disinformation using, using better algorithms, but we need to think bigger picture. And that means we need to think about the way that data is collected and the way it's leveraged in this whole digital ecosystem. And I think, to me, that, that starts with privacy and giving consumers control and choice and access in a similar way to, to GDPR. And with installing a a regime that can bring competition to the market in a far more uh, engaged way from, from Washington. And I think those are lessons that the whole world should take from, from Europe, actually. We have time for one more question. Um, I think somebody already got the mic. Yeah, I'm sorry, but maybe later. Uh, I hope it's a valuable, valuable question and then So uh, it's... I'm new to this topic. My name is Sergey. Hi. I'm yes, completely new to this uh, algorithm and so on, uh, problematic of the social media, because personally I don't use that. I have, mm -hmm. don't have Facebook. I have LinkedIn, but rarely using it and so on. So I, don't, I was all the time trying to understand the real problematic of these biases. So Alexander already mentioned that it's not probably fake news and so on, not much applied for Germany and so on. Yes, and I'm living in Germany and I see it's not that probably big problem and so on. And I was trying to realize what is there, what are we discussing here? Yes, I understand that there are some certain people who are complaining that, yes, I'm discriminated or something and so on. But in the end, if you're using so, some platform and so on, you agree to some terms of it. And I agree that to depend there's this commercial tension and the platform is being built for money. And of course, you're using this for your something, some, 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 something you want to achieve, and then you agree, it is fine. And of course, now people want to come in and complaining, we're losing our data and so on. But for me, it's still not that much relevant. So stop using this, find another way, and there are always other ways. <laughs> I, I can say, it personally, I quit my Facebook account four years ago, and uh, I just wanted to formulate one thing that 
uh, I like what the Teresa said about the thing. Another formulation of that uh, problem, uh, problem is that algorithms that themselves create a new environment and that new environment which is making people behave in a certain way, that these algorithms build our beliefs and build our preferences. And I think the, the biggest problem of the algorithms is that exactly this. This is not just learning our behavior, but it makes us behave in a certain way. And if somebody is putting news or something on us, then this exactly makes our society drive in a certain way. And I see this is the problem and so on. Am yes, I right? that, that has a long question. Maybe I think you already started answering your question yourself, but maybe, maybe somebody wants to jump in. And I think he, he gave out a, a very interesting challenge saying like, where is the big issue? Uh, I have a, definitely have an answer to that, but maybe someone of you wants to start. Not sure where to start. Um, <laughs> just to give an example of a, something that's clearly a problem, we've spent hundreds of years trying to regulate discrimination on the job market. If that sector suddenly extends to the web, we obviously have to make new laws to protect people online. And algorithms play a big part in that, and transparency plays a big part in that. Um, and I could say that prob this, probably the same about a bunch of different sectors. Um, yeah. You wanted it's to maybe the yeah. problem because the algorithms are everywhere. It's not like on Facebook. I can do yeah. the Elon Musk and can decide bye bye. I will delete my account and problem solved. But we have this amount of algorithms everywhere in the health system, in privacy, in predictive policing and so on, so you can't avoid them in the end. And we have to find good answers of regulation and how we want to deal with it. That's... Uh, nice work to you. Yeah, I was going to just say exactly what Alex said, which is that, yes, I think you're right. Uh, if you, if you want to leave Facebook or never use Google again, you could make that decision uh, today. But the thing is that the sticking cost is so high for, for the average consumer uh, because there is no competition, that, uh, that it's very hard to do that. If I want to join a service to connect with anybody that I've known in my life before, there's on, really only one service to be able to do that on. Uh, that in itself it's, is not a problem, but it, does be, it can become a problem if there is no oversight over, you know, with, without any respect for civil rights laws or housing laws or employment laws um, on those kinds of platforms. Not, not attributing such things to anybody in particular, but um, because, of, because that switching cost is so high, uh, given the way that Silicon Valley has really globalized, uh, that makes it very difficult to switch off your use of these platforms. It's, uh, it's similar to the concept of price elasticity. Um, when I... Uh, when I really like that band that's playing in Berlin, my favorite band, I, I'm going to pay whatever I want um, for, to, to go see it. It's not like you know, buying bread at the grocery. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Yes, uh, I want to thank the audience for having great questions, for your attention, and I would like to thank you speakers uh, for joining me for this really interesting conversation. I think there, there is still a lot to discuss that we will take from the stage into other discussions. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the session and I hope you have a nice uh, afternoon after this. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs>